it'll be fine if I just ask this one question and then I never speak again. So, so here's the question. Um, what brings you to this panel? Have you done prior work at this intersection or you wanted or planned to do such work? And what do you have in mind? That's the question. Um, who wants to go first? I'm trying to find my list of panelists so that I can make sure that I force everybody to talk. Well, I'll start. Thank uh, you. Since you know I'm on the panel anyway, Ted. So uh, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I come here uh, for several reasons. Uh, one, because my faith is the most important aspect of, of my life. Um, <clears throat> I come here because some of my research, not uh, certainly not all of it, but uh, some of it really emerged out of some deeper roots anchored in my in my faith. Um, and uh, and about 20 years ago, I came across um, came across a book that um, the title of it in particular has just uh, really stuck with me and is, is kind of one of the submodels, I guess, of, of my life. And the, the, the name of the book is All Truth is God's Truth. Um, and, and so in many ways, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about pursuing truth, uh, whether that's within my faith context. Uh, and the reason that that title caught me so much was because of my research. And it was like, wow, that's the core, the essence of what I do in my research. I'm about exploring truth. And it's like, oh. Uh, and so the, the intersection between my faith and, uh, and my research started to break down because of, um, or I should say the, 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 the categories of my faith and my research started to break down because of, well, I'm, I'm about seeking, I'm a, about seeking truth in particular, and that seems to be, um, so that's what's, that's important to me and drives me here. So does anybody want to respond directly to that or, or in parallel say what you brought you here? Dawn, you look like you're about to talk, so I think you should go next. Okay. Um, well, I think in the earlier session, I sort of talked to, of course, there's different people here, but I think I talked about this in that coming out of my PhD program, um, while my faith is really important to me, it was a, I kept those in very separate buckets. Um, and I did not even think about integrating I mean, my research, I use those principles, but the idea of researching something on faith or, or really integrating it into my teaching or into my classroom, those are really pretty relatively new concepts to me. It's, it's been over the past four or five years, and I, I have shared this book, and I'll share it again, um, and it, it is, um, it's called A Grander Story, An Invitation to Christian Professors, and I know this is just about Christianity, the book itself, but I think it applies um, to many religions. And I think for me, the, the book has really pushed me. We've I've gone, been through it twice, although quite frankly, um, each time it feels as if I have never opened it before, but um, mm -hmm. it has really pushed me into thinking about how to integrate what I truly believe into my classroom. And this doesn't just have to be in faith. Um, this can be the other principles that we have but I sort of had this sense, and maybe it's because I'm first generation, or maybe, um, I don't know, but this was that I, I came into academia, and, and I was supposed to be this person who really was kind of devoid of their faith and their, you know, those kinds of things. And so it's it's just been for me the last few years that I've really, um, you know, felt that, uh, that that I can integrate these things. So... I just appreciate hearing from all of you. Someone asked about the book. It's called A Grander Story. Um, so. this, this is like this is like my students. It's like I actually have to call on people to get somebody to go next. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna. 
I, I, I can go next. Can you hear me? I'm having technical difficulties. Um, yes, yes, we can hear you. And okay. thank you for two. Thank you for two volunteers. Why don't you go, Yolanda, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was scrambling all around trying to push the right buttons. Um, the so I come at it from a different perspective. It's a more intellectual curiosity perspective, not from a faith based. Although I consider myself driven by faith or uh, following a Catholic faith. Um, I did this, uh, my Conger mentioned it at the early session, I did a study looking at pastors as social entrepreneurs. Um, and it just was the most fascinating uh, study. It was uh, at what, uh, what we saw was that they indeed saw themselves as social entrepreneurs. And if you asked them questions like, how do you measure performance? And where do you see yourself in five years? And who's your biggest competitor? Uh, and uh, these were all very meaningful questions to me. And so at the last session uh, that I met lots of the people that are here, uh, we, I talked about entrepreneurship as religion and it was kind of being facetious and funny. And we talked about how some people who study entrepreneurship talk about it as if it were religion, uh, it, it, as if they, as if don't even question basic principles. Um, and the Don was putting up a book and, you know, uh, Jeff, Jeff McMullen, you know, I'm always proud of myself when I read, I can mention one book that's out of the, out of academic tradition. And of course, then he mentions 20. Um, this is my latest reading. It's uh, Sapiens. Um, by, uh, but by Harari, and it's the brief history of humanity. And one of the things they've been able to do during this quarantine time is do virtual book clubs. So I sign up for book clubs with one, this one I'm reading with somebody from California, one from New Mexico, and we're going through it slowly, uh, two chapters at a time. Uh, and he's, he's a big thinker. He's, uh, uh, Jewish in Jerusalem, although I think he's more Buddhist when you read his book, um, but he has a chapter in religion, the history of religion, and he, and he goes through the history of evolution of religion, but he ends with the newest religions are versions of humanism, um, and, uh, and he talks about, uh, let's see, I wrote it down, so his definition of religion is a system of human norms and values that's founded on a belief in a superhuman order. Uh, and then, and, and, and then his, I'm just trying to, so then, and then he categorizes these humanism religions as liberal humanisms, socialist humanisms, and evolutionary humanisms. Um, and so it's really gotten me into questioning people's beliefs when it sounds like a religion. Uh, and you all may know my colleague, Tom Dean. I like to tease him that sustainab sustainability is his religion. And so if you question it, it's almost as if you're questioning religion. So I like to tease him and say, what's so great about biodiversity anyway? And it, it's as if, as if you're at questioning his God. You know, it's, it's like saying, it's like saying, <laughs> do you, you know, how do you know Jesus lived? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so that's, I'm just, I, I'm exploring it from a different, from a different perspective. Thank, thank you. So, so, so let, let's go in this order. I don't know Devin and I don't know Jared. So why don't we do Devin, then Jared, and then Tom. Sure, thanks. Um, good to be here. Uh, kind of following off of that, I, um, I, the faith traditions that I research and the ones that have influenced me are ones that are in many ways actually antagonistic toward and suspicious of entrepreneurship, business, and certainly capitalism. Um, and so I, the, my interest certainly is in is the, the question of integration is actually a novel sort of thing that these could actually work together in ways that people in faith traditions would see as somehow mutually beneficial and positive. Uh, so I, you know, I'm coming at it from a different perspective and certainly very interested in that. And my research looks at 
partly early Christianity, but also its development through through the, uh, the Middle Ages into the modern world and the ways it has used uh, economic and uh, even business ideas in its own theology. So there is an interesting kind of double play of a rejection of some of these, these ideas, but then an incorporation of them into things like the language of redemption, which is an economic idea. Um, so there's a fascinating kind of uh, push and pull that I've been tracing and been interested in. And so I'm, I'm uh, yeah, very interested in, in this conversation and, and to hear these uh, different perspectives. So it's good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone, I'm Jared. Uh, I too come at this topic um, from having done some research in this area. My background's in sociology and, you know, there are many sociologists that study religion uh, my dissertation work was on socially responsible investing, and I looked at a, a handful of religiously affiliated mutual funds in the United States. Uh, so that was about 10 years ago. Um, and it, it, it has been fascinating the last decade how much uh, ESG, SRI investing has really exploded because um, it wasn't long ago I'm like able to count on one finger or, or on two hands how many fun families are out there and it was a pretty small area and uh, I've been interested in, in that um, secularization perhaps of the SRI industry where it's really gotten big. Um, the, the other thing I would say, and, and it perhaps pertains to the antecedents uh, aspect of this, um, some other research I've done looks at uh, contested commodities or this idea that some market services and, and uh, products are off limits and uh, there's a religious uh, hesitancy perhaps or a moral hesitancy to even put together uh, different kinds of logics. Uh, so from an institutional theory, uh, logics perspective, religion and business um, can, can uh, kind of awkwardly fit together. Um, so I'm interested in, in kind of that tension as well. Uh, so from an entrepreneurial angle, uh, are some things off limits and our, and our religious sensibilities kind of uh, keeping entrepreneurs away from certain areas of the market. Um, Viviana Zelitzer is a sociologist who looked at life insurance uh, back in the 1850s and showed, you know, a lot of people were resistant to this new market idea. Life is sacred. How could we dare put a price tag on it? Uh, and so, you know, religious actors were slow to pick up this new, this, this new idea called life insurance. So that, that might be one example of the, the areas that I'm interested in. Um, I've looked at um, patent, putting a patent on a scientific discovery as one outcome of kind of a contested commodity. commodity should we be uh, making money off of our scientific discoveries, thinking about life sciences and, and biology. So that's kind of one topic area that I've looked at. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, never least, Tom. Thank you, Ted. So um, I come to this, um, well, for a couple of things. First of all, I was, I was brought up uh, in um, a Christian household. I had a religious upbringing. Um, I um, uh, had, you know, like a grandfather who was Baptist minister and, and all of this. Um, and I would even go so far to say is, you know, I had like, experiences in the Christian church when uh, when I was younger and I also um, but but I also pivoted and uh, got into uh, meditation and into re Eastern religions and into writing that interprets the Bible uh, through another lens uh, and I, I honestly at the when I got up this morning I wasn't going to mention this but there was a you know I'm just trying to add some ballast to all the Christian perspectives we've we've heard today, uh, and so if I had a book to hold up, it would be Autobiography of a Yogi, which uh, is reportedly the only book that uh, Steve Jobs had on his iPad, and it is uh, um, very much a perspective that does not say in any way that you shouldn't be a Christian, uh, it uh, or should be a Jew or you know follow me instead of this. It's about how to be a better Christian or a better Jew or a better Muslim. And so, uh, or, or a better uh, Hindu, that's the tradition that he comes out of. And so um, to tell you the truth, um, I don't see a strong um, uh, preponderance of connecting faith and business in that uh, tradition so much as I did in the old days in the Christian church that I was a part of where 
there were a lot of, I mean, I was a member of a charismatic Christian church in my 20s. And, and uh, they, there were a lot of people who were like, you know, um, uh, you know, give God the glory and let, and let him, her run the business. And so um, uh, I find that interesting uh, that there are different perspectives uh, that are coming to play here. Um, and um, I will say this, that although the goal of meditation in, in, these, um, uh, in, in the practice that I do is not, you know, to uh, lower your heart rate or to, you know, uh, have, be, be more effective in the workplace, that really isn't the goal. That is a, you know, a, a side benefit and a consequence. That is to say, you can make the case that, um, uh, you know, a, a, a good meditator has a, you know, sort of clearer intuition, clearer uh, ideas that uh, then can inform their whole life, not just uh, their business life. So I would add to that, I, I, I presently don't really have any projects that I'm working on in this area, but I, I feel like, and, and, you know, from the previous session, um, um, Chuck made uh, Chuck Marines made an interesting comment about the um, uh, about the um, this being a moment, and you know we we maybe this is more important, and we haven't been looking at it all this time. It sort of feels like that to me. It sort of feels like that that um, you know uh, Anderson and Reeb Miller and uh, uh, it, it, and LeBreton Miller moment in family business research when the statistics were such that, you know, my gosh, th there are so many f family businesses, legitimately family businesses, that the idea that we're not looking at this in which, in which in, when we consider the implications and consequences and mechanisms and how these businesses operate uh, is, uh, is a real shortcoming. And I think that may be what's going on here. There are, you know, uh, powerful things that have to do with people's faith that I think uh, might have strong explanatory power in, uh, in, in, in our research. And so I think it's a, you know, it's a good thing to step into and have a look at. Thank you. I, so I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, like sort of thinking about this conference and thinking about faith and entrepreneurship and religion and entrepreneurship. And the person sort of compared it to the family business literature. And, Frederica Velter and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago where we decried the sort of ghettoization of some subfields within entrepreneurship. For example, stuff on, on, on gender and entrepreneurship, to a certain extent, the family business literature and so forth, where it's like people have developed sub-disciplines with their own good journals, with their own communities and so forth. And we argued that that's reduced the influence that some of that work has had on sort of the mainstream journals and more mainstream entrepreneurship stuff. And I, I do wonder and worry a little bit whether the same thing is likely to happen with developing a community of sort of faith-oriented people starting to look at these things, whether there's sort of the danger of creating a, another ghetto where people who are interested in this write about it and develop their ideas rather than trying to use this stuff more directly to influence mainstream conversations and entrepreneurship. So there's, I have, I have a list of questions here that I sort of interpreted from the ones that were sent to me and that, that, that Dave Townsend and I worked on a little bit. Um, and we're really sort of fortunate here because we have a couple of, of, of like we have a religious studies scholar on the panel um, and we have people who've who've drawn from other fields and the work they're doing and so forth. And I, and I want to get to that, but and I want to ask one very specific question, which is, I have to admit, is it's because I'm really interested in it, um, rather than necessarily because it's the best question. So this is this relates back to work, again, that, that Richard Hunt at Virginia Tech has done on Quakerism and sort of these things, which is really just sort of enthralled me. Um, so the, here's, I have the question written. Prior research suggests that in certain cases, for example, the anti-slavery activism of the Quakers lead into numerous advances in technology to eliminate the need for slave labor, right? The Quakers were anti-slavery, anti right? And they said, okay, how is it that we can reduce the demand for slavery? And one way would be to automate some of the things that slaves were doing as manual labor. So they came up with innovations to reduce the demand for this, right? And so it's sort of like, so this is, Dave, Dave Townsend wrote this question for me, um, right? The, right, the sort of, this is like, 
I, we see this as like the, the unique moral impulses of religious communities seeding the emergence of imaginative new possibilities for entrepreneurial action, right? This is like they, 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 their moral commitments, right? Caused them to see this opportunity and then they acted on it. I wonder if anybody can think of any contemporary examples of new innovations that are emerging from diverse religious communities. I think this is a hard question. And if nobody has anything on this, we'll move on. But I just, I, I just, I can't get over thinking about this because because the, the the Quakers sort of amaze me. This, I'll, I'll just jump in here. This isn't quite an innovation, but it is kind of capturing new technology. So one of the my little areas of research is on cryptocurrency and blockchain and religious sort of attitudes toward it. Um, so this is not about innovation, but it's about certain religious groups trying to be ahead of the curve and in integrating blockchain technology. Um, you know, there was one a few years ago, a, a new religious movement that was attempted to get started. I actually don't know what became of it. I haven't heard much of it in a couple of years, but it was trying to somehow use blockchain to essentially crowdsource doctrine. So the idea of blockchain as being transparent, as being um, crowdsourced, as being a diffuse network of authority, as opposed to being centralized with these ideas of whether it's central government, fiat currency, or a central religious figure, it was trying to sort of run with this idea of uh, communally based authority, um, like a really sort of radical congregationalism, if you will. Um, and trying to use use that to shape its beliefs. And again, I, I don't know um, exactly what's become of it, and it may it may have petered out. But that's that's was one example that came to mind, at least, of trying to be on the cusp of something. Yeah. Kevin, can I respond to you? Sure. Um, right. We we just published a paper on blockchain, and blockchain is one of those areas that people roll their eyes if you start talking about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and we'll start off with like, can you just explain what blockchain is to me? Um, but when I when we were talking to these people who are implementing uh, implementing blockchain, it was exactly as I was talking about before. It felt like you're talking to a group of religious people. Uh, I, I mean, they, they would uh, they just the people that we were connected with um, were like, this is going to change the world. And it's going to change the world for the better. And we're going to be able to bypass huge institutions. It's going to be able to give power back to the people. Um, and, and again, if you question it, if it's like, well, is that, you know, are there any negative consequences? Um, they look at you like you were violating their religion. It was, it was like, what are you even talking about that there might be negative consequences? So it's, it is interesting. And, you know, I didn't, we didn't go far enough to say, um, you know, delve more into what their specific relig religion was, but it was definitely very individualistic, very libertarian um, focus is what, what we were picking up. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Can I add something, Ken? Please. So I mentioned that this morning, I was in an earlier session. I don't have any example, but I think one of the factors that tends to get ignored is religious pluralism, which is the coexistence of different religions within societies. And I think that would be, you know, potentially an avenue to look at does that encourage these types of innovations? I don't have any examples, but if you have so many different beliefs competing against each other, would that help people maybe think outside the box? Just kind of an empirical possibility. Thank you. Just to, just to jump on that, Rodney Stark wrote a great book. It's like called The Victory of Reason was on kind of that notion to some extent of why um, you saw the Christian churches, especially Protestant churches, do so well in the United States because of that competition that you just didn't see in Europe because of the, the because of the Catholic Church having more of a monopoly situation for a long time. And so he, his argument is basically it was like a rational choice model. And it, because of that, the customer got served in a spiritual sense and they got more you know, everybody likes ice cream, but they like a different flavor of ice cream, right? And so that was basically their um, approach to why you saw Christianity spread so quickly and do so well in the United States was his argument, but. 
yeah, to, to elaborate on Jeff's point, it was it's the idea of uh, competition, right? Competition among faiths, among faith communities, just like we have competition in other contexts, you know, leading to more innovation and more successful outcomes. Related to that also, and to Praveen's point, um, you know, I think the, it's, it's kind of the mainstream consensus now among economic historians that the, you know, the reason that the scientific and commercial revolutions or originated in Western Europe, followed by the industrial revolution and so forth, was because of this notion of sort of decentralization. I mean, while you had a unified church, it was also a transnational church. So you, you didn't have the um, you didn't have a single state connected to a single church. So you had uh, people had sort of divided loyalties. There was the there was the authority of your temporal ruler of the prince, but then the prince himself was subject to the authority uh, of the church. And so it was this competition among jurisdictions within and across levels that uh, led to sort of this explosion of creativity and innovation. And so there are a lot of ways that we could incorporate that into macro, more macro level studies of, you know, sort of institutional conditions that allow entrepreneurship and innovation to flourish. I, guess I can address your, your initial question, Ted, back to what I mentioned earlier, and that's the socially responsible investing era. I'm not a historian, but I've read a lot of people point to the religious origins of that movement uh, both the negative screening, no tobacco, no gaming, no fun, you know, the Protestant churches didn't want to invest in that. And then the South African apartheid um, was really, really a catalyst that uh, a lot of um, institutional, religious institutional investors said, we're not going to support any banks that support South Africa. Um, and, and there's kind of two sides of this. There's the negative screening. Uh, I'm sacred, I don't wanna own that stock. I don't wanna to touch it. So I'm just not gonna buy any tobacco stocks. But then you also have uh, Catholic nuns who say, no, let me let me buy some stock in that. And then I'm gonna to go to the, the shareholder meeting and I'm gonna use my voice to actually try to make a change in the world. And I've always been fascinated how those two, two kind of sides of morality or religious sensibilities stay away from the stuff that's bad versus get engaged. You see both of that happening in, in the broader um, ethical investing space. So uh, that's one thing that yeah. came to my mind. Yeah, I, I, th I think those are excellent examples. Thank you. Anything else on this before we move on to another question? Uh, hi, yes. Um, I just had um, a comment to make to respond to your question and then also a question after that. Um, but yeah, so, um, I, and like, uh, I wanted to raise my hand because um, yeah, just I'm like I'm not a panelist, uh, but but um, I do have some personal experience. Um, so I grew up uh, in the Mormon Church, you know, um, and you know, like saw a lot of exposure to this entrepreneurial aspect. You know, um, in a sense, uh, you know, like the Mormon Church is like maybe the most American religion we have in terms of coming out of like uh, like the origins of um, you know like the history of our country, you know, um, and they've done some really interesting organizational things kind of in a corporate way in terms of like of um, entrepreneurial activity, you know, like how they have like the system of these missionaries that, that they go out and teach, you know. Um, yeah. And so like, I think that's a fascinating thing to study because they have also are doing a lot, a lot of diverse things too, you know, and like, um, like Devin was saying, you know, like th there's a lot of different religion is doing a, a lot of different things um but then i also wanted to ask to um uh like dr klein uh what his view on this was you know because i see a lot of the activities that are that seem to be driving decisions you know in the mormon church are things you know um like to avoid paying taxes and things like that you know um and those types of things about power and at the level of policy, you know, uh, that may drive entrepreneurial activity, you know, yeah, it's like more, more a advantageous to be a religious organization for tax purposes and things like that, you know, so, yeah, so just, just want to ask that. Thank you. Peter, would you like to respond to that? Oh, uh, it's a great question. I don't have anything particular uh, uh, to add, but uh, yeah, I think probably a lot of work on the impact of the institutional environment probably has not given as much attention 
I mean, we, we certainly talk about norms and culture, you know, as they as they encourage or maybe discourage people to engage in entrepreneurial activity, uh, but but probably not as much as we have studied, you know, sort of more formal institutions, law and politics, et cetera. Thank you. So as I've been listening to the earlier session I was in in this one, um, I wonder a little bit about the representativeness of different global religions and these sort of community of scholars who are publishing regularly in elite management and entrepreneurship journals. Um, there's, there's a really strong Christian flavor to, to much of what we've been hearing, which is fine, but I wonder as, as we start asking and try to answer questions around this, how much the body of literature that emerges is going to be um, shaped by the, by, by the distribution of faith commitments among the people who sort of have the privileged position of publishing in some of these journals. And it sort of, it, it leads me to, to one of the questions that I'm interested in, which, um, which is, I think I'll ask that, is it, which has to do, so from my perspective, I mentioned this last session as well, I, I don't think entrepreneurship has a fantastic track record of doing a great job of borrowing in a profound way from other fields from which we're trying to take insights. I, th I think this didn't work very well with psychology early on. I don't think it worked well with sociology. I don't even think it worked very well with economics. Um, certainly didn't work well with anthropology and so forth. And it occurs to me, right, there's a world of religious studies scholars who are out there who sort of have sort of deeper understanding of some of these things and have their own theoretical perspectives and so forth. And I'm, I'm just wondering how it is that, that we should go about moving beyond our own, you know, particular idiosyncratic knowledge of these things. So there are some people who are in this room right now who've, who've, who've read a lot about this stuff, but, but how do we draw effectively and work with people who have sort of long-standing interest in research on these topics, and so that we don't we don't try to reinvent the wheel, or worse, reinvent a bad wheel, and like, and sort of more specifically, like, are there particular people or fields we should be drawing on? Is there some way we should sort of approach trying to collaborate with people who know more about this stuff? Like, like, like I'm a little bit I'm a little bit afraid of just the idiosyncrasies of the faith commitments of the people who are the usual players in entrepreneurship research and their understanding of these things to the exclusion both of a more diverse sort of set of set of faiths being brought to the table, but more than that, not bringing in deeper research on these things. Um, and I'm going to point my finger at you, Jared, because when I looked at the background of people on the panel, it seemed like you would, um, you would have some some insights in this, and I'm going to point my finger at you as well, Devin, because I think you may be able to speak to this. I suspect you may be able to speak to this better than some of the rest of us. Sorry to put you on the spot, but there you have it. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure uh, I have anything profound to say, but you know, I had the experience of coming from a PhD in sociology and entering the field where I am now, which is completely different. And so I'm aware of kind of bridging these uh, disciplinary boundaries. Um, and it's difficult. And I, I think I found myself working more towards dealing with morality in a general sense in my own research trajectory. And I not, don't really identify myself any longer as a religion and markets kind of scholar. So I think I think that was part of my own personal trajectory in, in my research. Uh, but I think you're raising good questions and th th to be aware that uh, there, there are lots of scholars out there who, have, uh, who, who are experts in religion and how to, how to come together and uh, benefit from it without stopping your career for five years to read up on everything you, you, haven't, you, know, you haven't read on. That's, that's not the answer, right? Um, so, it's a great question, Devin. Can you help me at all? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. This is a great. It's a great, a great issue. I just uploaded a uh, article, a recent entry um, from an anthropologist, Webb Keen, who's been who's been studying um, 
I mean, he's grounded in field work in Indonesia primarily, but he's expanded to think about religion and economy more, more broadly. The bibliography there may be helpful as, a, as just a start, but it's also a great summary article of this whole issue of re religion connected to questions of religion, morals, values, ethics on one hand versus economy, business, exchange on the other and the kind of fraught relationship that um, it's had. Um, and, and so a couple, I guess a couple ideas. One, I think, I mean, it's a great, it's a great, question and issue. I think what, what are the kinds of institutional spaces we can create where conversations can happen, right? I mean, that's one of the things. So what, whether they're gatherings like this, mini conferences, et cetera, to get people in the room to talk to each other. Um, I, you know, I would think that sociologists and anthropologists of religion would be a great sort of set of dialogue partners. There are folks that study, um, you know, the economic motivations of different religious movements and groups from anthropological and sociological perspectives. And I think methodologically, there might be a lot of overlap with those of you who study entrepreneurship because many of you were trained in similar social scientific disciplines, right? It might be harder for you to talk to somebody who does like critical text studies of like ancient documents because it's a different kind of training in this humanities perspective versus those that are trained in social science. And so there's a little bit of a methodological overlap. So I think seeking out anthropologists and, and um, sociologists of religion, and then within that, there are really interesting studies. I mean, there's stuff coming out. There's tons of stuff now about China, right? Like religion in China and its, and its connection to its economic boom. Um, I mean, it, to sort of counterbalance this sort of Christian bias that I think you, you've rightly highlighted. Um, and, you know, likewise, just global, global studies of, of uh, Muslims in Indonesia, um, really interesting studies of Islamic finance, uh, and, and Islamic banking. Uh, there are book, book, length, book length studies of all of these things that, are, that have been happening in the last 10 years. So there's a rich literature out there. Um, but I, as you said, it's like, how do, you, how do you get that on your radar screen? And I think the issue is gathering people in the room to have these kinds of um, these, con these conversations. Thank you. You know, it occurs to me that th this sort of seems like low hanging fruit, although it also might be rather descriptive, uh, over, oversimplified even. Uh, but if we are at the beginning of this process, then, then, then maybe that's okay. And the theme of this session is antecedents. It seems to me that it's easy to pose um, questions uh, to um, uh, entrepreneurs about uh, you know, the, the, the nature of faith, the experience with faith, the religion that they come from, their, whether they've had a crisis for faith, of faith, whether they have a you know, faith that is um, bound with a lot of scripture or whether they have a faith that is, you know, sort of widely construed, or maybe it's the faith of, you know, uh, Tony Robbins, right? You know, uh, uh, sort of like some of the stuff that um, uh, Jeff was talking about in the opening, you know, faith takes a lot of different forms. And it seems to me that simply trying to take stock of, uh, of, of, of the different faiths that individuals bring to this and then analyze, you know, outcomes and process or processes and outcomes in light of that would at least begin to, you know, give you some something to take to an anthropologist or a sociologist to say, what are we to make of this? And so it, it does seem to me that there's, you know, there's an opportunity to, to, to ask people, you know, what is, what is your faith? What is your religion? What do you bring to the table? And, and, uh, and see if there aren't just, you know, simple, correlations and, and insights that can come from that kind of descriptive work. Perhaps you've just pointed to the missing dimension of entrepreneurial orientation. Ooh, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we wouldn't get through this without you making a you know. <laughs> That was just that was quite <laughs> serious. Okay. Yeah. Do we have, we, we, go ahead. Okay, anybody else on this? You know, I think the other aspect to it too is religion is something so personal and you don't really get to write about it unless you're into it. And, you know, I think your question had to do with representation and, and a lot of the training is happening in the US and Europe. And, and, you know, I'm an editor of the religion and spirituality at Journal of Business Ethics. And, if you have strong papers, let's say coming from India, but maybe poorly crafted, they have some kind of gatekeepers who will look at it and say, can we give that a second shot? 
So I think that's another possibility is the gatekeepers, the journal editors and so on, deliberately say, you know, there's some, this is diamond in the rough. Can we help these scholars kind of polish to get it to where we can then communicate it to this audience? Because, you know, it's one of these things you read about Islam, can you write about it, right? And, and that's kind of, I see lots of interesting stuff coming out of these places, but then they are never up to what we are used to in terms of level. Was that kind of what you were asking, Ted? That was my <laughs> interpretation. I, I mainly wanted to make the point of the potential bias and narrowness that would come because of the prior selection of the people who are doing research, um, yep. both, both in terms of religious diversity, but also in terms of sort of disciplinary um, reach and what we're doing. So, so I, think your, I think your answer complements Devin's answer nicely in terms of some institutional mechanisms that are available to us to sort of try to encourage this. I'd, I'd like to move on to a question that's come from the chat, which is from Christine Beach, um, which is, I'm going to read it. it, says, historically faith groups have been more engaged in entrepreneurship when they are marginalized from mainstream economic opportunities or their needs are not met by that group. So perhaps innovation in faith-based groups is less prevalent as their needs are met in a more accepting economic environment, right? This sounds like an actual beginning of a hypothesis, right? Sort of like sort of like a, a focused research question. I, I, I wonder if anybody has a response to this. Do you agree with the premise? Certainly intriguing. Uh, I was like, like, wow, I haven't thought of that before, but I, I, you know, like, I mean, that's the trump card of entrepreneurship, right? Of, uh, of allowing people to do things that, you know, <laughs> normally they haven't been able to do. It puts, puts wheels on the vehicle. So I think it's very interesting the hypothesis. There, there's a chapter in Peter Kilby's like 70, 1971 book, I think and it was, I think it was by a sociologist and I, I'm blanking on the name, might've been younger or something like that, that, that developed some of those ideas in a chapter. And it was really interesting. It was, um, it was great, but I never saw anybody really pick it up and run with it. I, I, I by the way, that whole book's full of great insights and stuff, but that, uh, but there is, there is a, there is a, a trickle of a stream out there that, but I don't know if it just dried up or if it went underground and went to another field, but it would definitely be worth looking at and tapping into if, if somebody's interested in that. There are certain things to uh, Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, I think that a lot of the literature on employee spin outs would apply to uh, religious pluralism, right? I mean, look at uh, how many different, uh, certainly within Christianity and, and, not, and within other faiths as well, how many new uh, sects or groups are basically, you know, they they broke off from the from the parents. You know, the, the Protestant Reformation could be understood as a sp employee spin out, right? With Martin Luther as the uh, as the person with you know the particular human capital or whatever. I mean, the point is we have a rich literature on the circumstances under which members of existing organizations leave to to create their own. You know, either sort of the positive sense. You know, like Fairchild Semiconductor, right? They learned about how to do the task well at the parent organization. But we have all these other examples of sort of negative spin outs. I'm not able to do the things I want to do in the parent. So I end up uh, starting my own organization. I mean, gosh, you could recast the whole history of religion, at least to some extent, right, in that kind of language. So it seems like that would, that would apply to this particular question. Under what circumstances, for example, the marginalization perceived marginalization of the key actors, um, you know, other kinds of environmental conditions, are we more likely to see reform within a religious group as opposed to exit and the formation of a new group by the, you know, by the key players? I think that's, that's really an interesting question. And I, it, it's gotten that and some other things in the chat has got me thinking about um, uh, the Mormon religion. And I, I I doubt there are too many people who would say that the Mormons aren't extremely entrepreneurial um, and that some of this comes from the foundation um, of the church. But perhaps, 
perhaps this is part of it, right? It's a relatively, compared to Judaism or Christianity, it's a relatively new religion. Um, and I wonder if there is some sort of um, desire to, I, I don't know, provide some evidence or or something like that, that is, is driving some of that as well, some legitimacy questions. Um, and so maybe that's, that's part of that. It, it, it really, I just wanted to jump in there because there's been questions or comments about both. And I find that, that really interesting. Just to mention briefly, there have been some, some studies of this correlation. So it is certainly pointed out as, as one. Uh, the classic example are Jews in medieval Europe um, who are highly persecuted and marginalized and barred from many professions. And that results in significant innovation in within the fields that they are allowed in uh, finance being one of them. Um, and you know, there are studies of, of Jain communities in India that are, um, that are highly entrepreneurial, highly successful uh, mercantile communities that are also in some sense marginalized. And I think a case could be made for the, you know, the Protestant Reformation was mentioned, and certainly that's, you know, where a lot of the studies go is, is you know, Max Weber and the Protestants, but certainly their marginalization as being um, perhaps part of this as well. So I think there's a correlation, whether there's a causation is up for, is up for debate. Max Weber and the Protestants would be a great name for a band. <laughs> Okay, so, 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 Christine, did you want to unmute and sort of enter this conversation you've initiated? It, not too much more. To, I just I find it interesting, right? We, when I was um, doing some research on the topic, it seemed like um, the Catholic schools came out of a um, kind of a counter to what was then mostly a Protestant culture, uh, driving the public schools and the Jewish hospital that we saw kind of proliferate across the United States um, and is now going away as their needs are met in mainstream hospitals, they can get all their needs met. And so we're seeing some of these ebbs and flows in entrepreneurship that seem related to people's faith. And I was just curious if people had done research on that and if, they're, if they had seen that, but I think there was a good point made on whether it's causation or correlation. And I don't really know. Thanks for bringing it up. So, so we've we've had a little bit of Congress. So we, I'm just going to use something somebody said as a segue to talk about something I want to talk about, which is Don said that Mormonism is, is sort of a newer religion than some of the other mainstream religions we're talking about here. I'm just really interested in the act of trying to found a new religion or a new church or even a new sect within a church as an important form of entrepreneurship. Right, it's sort of, sort of the, the, that has you know fairly substantial possibilities for for bringing about important changes and things. And I'm just like like I, I I haven't seen anything in the entrepreneurship literature that sort of looks at this right. And I, again, I'm I'm the farthest thing that could be from a religious studies person. But when I looked into this a little bit for a paper I worked on a couple of years ago, right, right, most religions don't start out as legitimate. Right, sort of like there's this, right, this, as far as I can tell, there's, there's almost always some struggle for them to gain traction and legitimacy and so forth. And they start out more like things that we might today call cults, right, or have some other sort of disparaging way of referring to them. And it turns out, from what I can tell, that there's lots and lots and lots of people starting new, trying to start new religions or starting cults, right? like on a yearly basis, right? There's just a lot of activity with people trying to do this or trying to start new sects within sects within existing religions and so forth. And I'm just like, I'm just like, does anybody know of any research on this that takes it from an entrepreneurship perspective? Because particularly with my, my sort of interest in, in values driven things and identity and so forth, it just seems like that this, you know, from my perspective, how I do research, this might be a fairly extreme case of something where you might get some insights that were valuable more broadly. So does anybody know anything about this? You could make something up if you don't. I can speak to it a, a tad, not from um, new sort of completely new concepts, but there's a lot 
in church management around what they call church planting and particularly in in um urban contexts where you're you know you're within a specific denominational construct but you're standing up a new congregation for lack of a better term um there's a, there's a lot there they don't call it entrepreneurship but you know there's there's some stuff there more like a franchise <laughs> I mean, somebody uh, mentioned, somebody depending mentioned, on your perspective well, of how you view um, diastinal structures, yeah, you could call it a franchise. Someone mentioned Rodney Stark already, but Stark's work on in religion, religious economies do, does deal with this a bit in terms of looking at using this a rational choice uh, model of the firm and the corporate form to look at religious movements. So there is, oh, there is some there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Have you looked at Azioni's work, Ted? Um, and just I, 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 have, I, I have for a long time. Like, yeah, I mean, he did. He did mention some of that, and like, because at one point I thought it'd be really interesting to study entrepreneurship as cult foundation, you know, and go into that. And and that was kind of why I read some of the Jim Jones stuff and went through and read a, and and Zimbardo and some of that other stuff about how these cults are formed, because it was kind of the same notion of a leader are almost a shine type effect where the leaders creating the culture and all that. And I, I, I got into a little bit, but I had difficulty finding it as well. And I thought there would be a lot in um, the psychology of religion, especially in cultist and cultish type stuff. I thought there would be a yeah. literature out there and I just couldn't find it. And I know it's got to exist because the FBI and all these other organizations <laughs> invested a lot of money in, <laughs> in developing that. Um, so, you know, it's out there. Um, it's just, Maybe it's just not in on Google Scholar. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I found some stuff by historians and sort of like like historians of specific religions, sort of yeah. who who point to the role and the behaviors of the people identified as the founders of the religion and so forth. Not not much comparative stuff and, and not much taking anything that we would call an entrepreneurship lens to it. It just right. it, it seems it, it, it seems interesting and like like oh absolutely fa fa fairly low low hanging fruit. So so we're almost out of time. Um, does does anybody have any question they want to pose before I read you another one? Or instead of me reading another one, much better. I just wanted to um, throw something out there that I know nothing about, but that I think could be really interesting is this idea um, in some religions of tithing and how is there some time of link between tithing and, and social entrepreneurship, notions of social entrepreneurship or um, corporate responsibility or, um, you know, so, so there may be research out there, but it, it, it's just an idea that kind of um, I, I was just thinking about and wondering if anyone knew anything about that. I, I know I know a married couple who's currently having an argument about whether tithing is supposed to relate to pre-tax or after-tax mm -hmm. income. <laughs> uh, I just want to say, Ted, when you were talking, uh, I had the opportunity to have a theologian staying in my house. He had an office in his basement and he had walls and walls of these most profound books. We had really rich conversations. And it's like, I think one way we need to talk to each other, but we need to talk to others. We need out, completely outside of our field um, because there's, there's such rich dialogues going on. And I remember speaking to him thinking, I tried to explain to him what the, our research was and, and he, he, it seemed real simplistic. And he said, can you all fit things, all things on in bullet points? And I was like, oh, I don't know, we fit a lot in bullet points. And so I feel like we need to read broader and think bigger. No, we don't, we don't just have bullet points. We have regression models too. <laughs> so. Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm gonna, people can, people can obviously leave anytime they want, but the last question I wanted, so some people see conflict between religious and faith tenets and some of the key elements of traditional capitalism, right? Others have much the opposite view, right? Obviously going back to Max Weber or before, right? 
right? What's your take on this question? Right, right, right. Some people, some people I talk to think that religion and capitalism are hand in glove and sort of the, the religion may be what makes, like take some of the rough edges off of what capitalism might otherwise be, right? Other people see severe conflict between particular religious tenets and the behaviors motivated by capitalism. Um, this is a fairly stark question, but what do you think? So I think this is a fascinating question. I think, uh, so I've read quite a bit about it lately just because I've wrestled with it personally. Um, and and one of the books that I really enjoyed, I mean, I argued with him in my head the whole time, but I, I just loved it was uh, Michael Sandel's uh, The Tyranny of Merit that just came out in 2020. It's just a great book. It's really thought provocative. And 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 I, I just liked where he went down the whole idea of um, basically just desserts and, and do it does it really play out that way? And, and I thought it did a, did a fair job. Obviously he has his bias and you can see that in the, in the writings, but I think it, I think it's one of the better books I've read recently on this topic, um, just in terms of trying to play this out. It doesn't, I don't know if it goes as much into religion as we're talking about here, but it's definitely on these, these issues and these topics that were, these themes are the ones, you know. Right, it's, 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 it's the huge thematic similarities is yeah. the other stuff that's coming out about our sort of our our unconsidered belief in meritocracy. Right, right. right. And I, I think I think that's very close to what we're talking about here when yeah. we get into the religious uh, doctrine tied to capitalism and, and outcomes and inputs and deserving, you know, and do you deserve the outcome that you receive? And, and we it, it, that right. But you can look at it even in terms of things like global supply chains. Right, and, 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 and sort of like the, the, the distribution of costs and benefits and so forth, and you know, sort of what that means from this perspective. Other thoughts? I can add two cents. I think it depends on the religion. If you look at even within Christianity, we know about the Protestant work ethic and how it supported capitalism and so on, and even within the US. But, you know, if you look at Buddhism, maybe much more concern about the environment and caring of other people. Hinduism has like its stages of life, maybe different stages, you're doing different things. So I, I, I think maybe that's what you see, maybe it just depends. And, but I would say Protestant work ethic seems to be much more supportive. But again, my limited knowledge, I could be wrong here. So my two cents. Yeah, so, so so back when I was a graduate student and taking my my basic sociological theory class from Peter Blau, may he rest in peace, um, he made the point to us really vehemently that Weber was working from an N of one in the Protestant <laughs> ethic and the spirit of capitalism and suggested that there were a large number of challenges that could be made to this. I think, I think a number of people have made challenges and so forth, particularly in the varieties of capitalism literature and so forth. It's, it's funny to me, like in my, my own thinking, right, I, I just constantly return to this, right? Sort of like think like, oh, well, you know, capitalism came like this because these people, you know, sort of like wanted to, wanted to have some proof that, you know, that they're actually going to go to a better place when they died and stuff like this. And it's, it's really hard to disabuse myself of the notion that this is not absolute proof. And I, I, I think I keep hearing other people sort of do the same thing. I was like, like Weber demonstrated this sort of thing. And it's like, you know, it was, it was a cool book, but it was one book from one perspective. Right? It's like a single case study, right? Like, and I just think of how would Kathy Eisenhart criticize, you know, Weber <laughs> in doing this sort of thing, right? And it's like, I, 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 I just- Hey, by the way, uh, John Cullen was my advisor. He was a student of Peter Blau. So this is a very small world, you know. It, it is a very small world for sure. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I, it was a really broad topic and I think we covered all of it and basically we've answered all of the questions and with some finality. So we don't need to address any of this anymore. <laughs>